My name is Mary Beth Tinker and I grew up in Iowa where my father was a Methodist minister and then later we became involved with the Quakers in about 1963 because my parents believed in something called the social gospel which is still going on today. Many people follow this today but it means that you put your values into action here on earth and so that led them to become involved with the civil rights movement in the late 50s or really, yeah, the mid 50s and then into the 60s. And so in 1957, there was a swimming pool in the small town where we lived in Atlantic, Iowa, and they wouldn't allow black kids to swim there. And it was 1957, the same year as a Little Rock Nine. I was only five years old, but my dad and some kids from the church went up to the city hall and tried to change that. And as a result, some people in town got very mad about it and so my dad lost his job at the church and he lost his house. We lost our home because it went with the job. And so when I was five years old, we moved to Des Moines, Iowa. There, my parents also got involved with the growing civil rights movement. And my mother became friends with a woman named Edna Griffin, who had an Iowa Supreme Court case that she won it was an access case because she came back from World War II. She was a veteran <clears throat> and she was not allowed to eat at the local drugstore, Katz Drugstore. And so she protested that and she started this lawsuit and my mom got to know her and she won that lawsuit, I think before my mother even met her. But they got to be friends and they formed um, a group called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality in Des Moines. And so we would start you know, we started going up to the drugstore, Katz drugstore, and picketing because even though they would allow black people to have lunch there, they still would not hire any people of color. And so that's how I grew up. And I started to think it was kind of fun standing up against racial discrimination. And we would go to the capital, capital and picket, and we would do different things like that. So that's how I was raised, to put your values into action and take action right here, right now. Yeah, we were very inspired by young people in the civil rights movement. First starting with the Birmingham Children's Crusade in 1963. In May of that year, almost 2,000 kids in Birmingham were arrested while Martin Luther King had just been in jail writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail. And so the young people of Birmingham, they marched and sang and they came out of their headquarters, which was a 16th Street Baptist Church. And um, they had to build outdoor barbed wire prisons for the kids. There were so many. And then the, the children got attacked with German Shepherd dogs and the fire hoses of the firemen. And these photos went viral all over the world. So we, they, I mean, they were inspiration to us, but the whole, Civil rights movement in general, the things that we would hear about that were going on, and then the things that were going on right there in the north, in Des Moines, were very inspirational to us as well. Um, our friends, the Griffins, couldn't buy a house in a certain part of town because they were black. So there was a, um, a straw party that bought the house and then sold it to them. And um, I found out just recently that my dad was involved with that and that there was a fair housing group in Des Moines there. But the, the kids were so inspirational to us. And, and then when the Ku Klux Klan, which I like to tell students now as I travel around the country, they're called white nationalists and white supremacists. And they, there was also the White Citizens Council, but to punish the children, they put a bomb in their church on Sunday morning, September 15th. 1963, and when the bomb went off, the charred bodies of four little girls, Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise, were found in the church, rubble. Those girls were about the same ages as me and my sisters, and someone came by a picnic that we were having to tell us what had happened to those kids. And it was very, very sad. Uh, Addie Mae's sister also I think, was blinded so the next year was also, and I like to tell kids these stories as I travel around the country. I was just with, 
hundreds of middle school kids last year telling them these stories of young people who have stood up and spoken up for democracy, for love, for understanding, a better way, and taken action. But the next year, 1964, was also an amazing year for young people speaking up because that year, which is Freedom Summer, um, students were called to Mississippi by people like Fanny Lou Hamer and um, Robert Moses. And I'm sure that, you know, that, that everyone that was involved with SNCC was involved with this decision to bring students to Mississippi that year, and it was a very contentious decision. But um, I'm sure Julian Bond was involved with it as, as well. But when the students gathered in Ohio at Western College for Women to train, one of the people who had come up from Mississippi was James Cheney, and he had already been arrested a number of times. And so he trained the students, and then they went to Mississippi but as soon as they got there, three of them disappeared. And so everyone suspected that the KKK had murdered them. And the FBI started searching for them. At the end of the summer, on August 4th, 1964, the FBI found the bodies of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. On the very same day, off the coast of Vietnam, a U.S. Navy ship claimed it had been attacked, the USS Maddox. It turns out it had not been attacked. But that didn't stop the U.S. Congress from voting almost unanimously to escalate the Vietnam War and start sending thousands more soldiers to Vietnam. The war was already going on, but mostly in secret, under the radar of the public. So that was on August 4th. My parents then decided to go to Mississippi that summer. And so I was, I had just turned 11 years old. I, I was going to turn 12 years old, actually, on the day that they came home. And when they were there, they had just amazing experiences that they told us kids about later. Um, they went to the white church, the Methodist church, to try to reach out to their, you know, fellow white um, Christians. And they were forcibly put out of the church. And then they were staying with an older black woman. And um, she said that when the shooting starts tonight, don't worry because I'm used to it and you can sleep in the back. And so she, my parents were in the back that night and the shooting started and my parents rushed up to the front and they saw the lady crouched by the window and she said, and there was a pickup truck out there shooting at her house and had just killed her dog. And so my parents said, quick, let's call the sheriff, let's call the sheriff. And she said, honey, that is the sheriff. And there were, Experiences like that that my parents told us kids about when they got back to Iowa. How they had to lay in the floor of the station wagon that they were riding in so that they wouldn't be shot. And especially so that the African-American person who was driving would not be shot. And so through all of this, I learned that this was the way to live. To stand up for what you believe in, but there would be risks. But a very important thing happened that fall. Some students in Mississippi, African-American students, high school students, wore buttons to school that said, one man, one vote, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they were suspended for doing that by the principal. It was a black school. The principal suspended them and said that that was too controversial and they should not be wearing those buttons in school. And so a court case started. I had no idea that that case was going to be the foundation for students' rights even today in the United States public schools. Because when they won at the appeals level for the Fifth Circuit, the court said that they should have been allowed to wear those buttons because they had not substantially disrupted school. I had no idea that case was going to have an effect not only on students all over the country, but me personally, and also that it would be cited later in the Supreme Court case that several of us students in Des Moines became involved with having to do with students' rights later. The civil rights movement in Des Moines soon became very much entwined with the anti-war movement. My father had been put out of his church 
first in Atlantic and then again in Des Moines. He lost his church in Des Moines also because he started inviting black people, residents, neighbors to church. And it was an all white church on the east side of Des Moines. And so he, we lost, he lost that church also and we had to move again. So then instead of going to work for the Methodists, he remained being he retained his minister, let's see, he continued to be a minister, a Methodist minister in name, but he didn't have a church. And so he went to work for the American Friends Service Committee, which is um, the Quakers, the Friends. And so his job was to travel in a five state area talking about various conflict zones of the world, especially the growing Vietnam War. I would travel with him and I was very proud. I was uh, about fifth and sixth grade and I would put out the leaflets and the flyers and um, I started to learn about the Vietnam War. And of course the Quakers are all about peace. And so we would be standing up for peace in Vietnam as the war built up after Freedom Summer, after in 1965, especially in 64. Like now, there is a great intersection between issues, between the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement, and then eventually the women's movement and gay issues all became involved as well. And of course, economic inequality was huge. And so all of that went together, poverty. And in November of 19, 65, there was the first major national anti-war rally in Washington, D.C. There was a group in Des Moines called Iowans for Peace, and many of the Quaker families were involved, and also the Unitarians and others. My mother went there along with my brother John, and my sister Bonnie went from college. She was in Gr Grinnell College. And our friends, um, Chris Eckhart and his mother, also went to the rally. On the way home, people were discussing what could be done back in Des Moines about the war. And someone suggested the idea of wearing black armbands. Now, when the Birmingham children were killed in 1963, the four girls, we had worn, there had been a call put out by James Baldwin for people all over the country to wear black armbands to mourn for the little girls and that there should be memorial services. And so we had a memorial service in Des Moines in 1963. And that was my first experience with black armbands when we wore black armbands to the service. But then in 1965, um, we think it was a distant relative of Herbert Hoover who had the idea driving back from Washington DC, what about the idea of wearing black armbands again? This time to mourn for the dead in Vietnam on both sides of the war, which is what made it controversial for one thing, but also to support a Christmas truce that had been proposed by the North Vietnamese, but that Senator Robert Kennedy was supporting. And so when they got back to Des Moines, um, there was a meeting about it and some high school kids heard about it and kind of took the idea and ran with it and had the idea of wearing the black armbands to school. So that's how I heard about it. I was nervous and scared because I was so shy and I was one of the younger kids. Mostly it was being organized at Roosevelt High School with the high school kids. But I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal, but I didn't really like to stand out in general that much. I mean, I was in eighth grade, I was 13 years old. And especially when the principals heard about it and made a rule against black armbands, I was very nervous and it was kind of a moral dilemma because I didn't want to get in trouble. But there again, I remember these other young people, mostly from the civil rights movement, who had been brave, who had risked their lives and even lost their lives to speak up for what they believed in. There were 50 kids who were planning to wear black armaments to school to mourn for the dead in Vietnam. But when the principals came out with their rule against it, it dropped way down. So. I think the very first day there were about five kids. Well, even my little sister, Hope, who was in fifth grade, my little brother, Paul, was in second grade, they wore black armbands also. It was on December 16th. So Chris Eckhart 
was suspended that day. I was suspended that day. I think Chris Singer, who was in the high school, was suspended that day. My little brother and sister weren't suspended. But uh, I think in the end, a total of about seven students wore the black armbands. Five were suspended. One boy, Perry Hutchison, wore the armband on the wrong day. And so that was before there was a rule against armbands. So he was and he was not suspended. It could have been the Perry Hutchison case. My dad didn't think that we should wear the armbands. And he said, you know, I don't think you kids should be wearing those armbands because it's against the rules. And the principals, they don't have an easy job either. But kids are so persuasive. And so my brother talked to him and told him, you know, Dad, people are dying. And this is just a little piece of cloth. And then we talked to him about our conscience. Because my dad had always taught us to stand up for our conscience. Because he had friends who died in World War II. And he said, if you don't stand up for your conscience, we could have the Nazis in charge. So you always must stand up for your conscience. And all for your conscience. And also we said, Dad, look how you do what you believe. He had even risked his life in Mississippi. He had lost his job at the church for speaking up against um, racism and discrimination. So we convinced him. Eventually he said, well, I guess you're right. You know, I have taught you to stand up for what you believe in. I was so nervous the day that I wore the black armband to school. And my friend Connie, I think she told me I shouldn't wear that armband because it's against the rules. But I said, Connie, I'm so sad about the war, which I was because thanks to the brave journalists also who were bringing us news of the war every evening. Um, but I got there and nobody really made a big point of me wearing the black armband. I went through the morning classes. I think I was at sewing class, which I took then social studies. Um, and then at lunchtime, well, we sat with the girls' table. I did. And then the boys' table, some boys were teasing me and saying, I want an armband for Christmas and things like that. But um, I ignored them like I always did. And then after lunch, I went to my teacher, Mr. Moberly, was my math teacher. And I loved math. And I loved Mr. Mr. Moberly. I liked him too. But he had spent the whole day before saying how if we wore black armbands, we would be in trouble. And so I was really nervous to go to his class. When I got there, he was holding a pink slip in his hand. And um, he, I, gave, I took it and I went to the office. And I was really, really nervous. And I sat down there. And Mr. Willitson, the vice principal, told me to take off the armband. And I looked around the office and I looked at him. And I took off the armband. And I kind of thought it was all over then. But as you see, it's not. It hasn't been over. So then I was suspended by the girl's advisor, Mrs. Tarman, anyway. And that, that's what happened. But I went back to class, and I was really surprised that she called me back to the office. And I got suspended anyway. So I took my suspension paper, and I went home. I knew my mother would understand. And by this time, we had kind of convinced my dad and so there was there were some people that gathered that night and talked about what to do. My brother John tried to call the president of the school board to see if they would change their mind, but they wouldn't change their minds. So that's what happened. Remember that I know we were supposed to wear them on December sixteenth. Mm -hmm. And then after we got suspended, um, it was just a few days before Christmas holiday. Mm -hmm. So then when we went back to school, we couldn't wear the armbands. By that time, the ACLU was involved. And I'm not sure if they contacted my parents or if my parents or the Eckhart's contacted them. But there was a woman named Louise Noun in the Iowa ACLU, and she kind of made it her cause to get them to help us. Without, they said, well, first of all, you have to negotiate. So go back to the school board and try to have another meeting, try to change their mind, which we did. Mm -hmm. And that was in January, but they wouldn't change their mind. And so then we went back to school, and we couldn't wear the armbands because the ACLU said, well, you just get suspended again. And so what we did was we wore all black clothes. Okay. 
for the rest of the year. And we said, well, they can't tell us to take our clothes off. So I love telling students that there's always a way, just keep thinking about another way that you could get your message across or that you could change what it is that isn't fair, that isn't right, that you need to change. Like now, war was pretty much ignored. And people didn't think a lot about it. I mean, it, it was on the news and people were worried that their friends or family could be called to the war. But I've seen surveys that said that about 85% of people were generally in favor of the war. About 15% were against the war by then. It was 1965. But of course, the anti-war sentiment built up, especially on the part of soldiers and veterans. And I think that's really what turned the tide a lot. A lot of people say it's students, and you think of Vietnam protesters as being students, but really it was a lot of soldiers and and veterans. And I think on almost every army base, navy base, means there was an anti-war newspaper or anti-war activity. I was raised to take action on the values that we believed in, and the values that we believed in were equality, justice, and peace that was in our faith upbringing. It was also the values that we learned in school. And so in our family, there was a culture that you should do something about that. And we had many, many examples of people who did that in our lives. And so that was, I think, why we decided that, number one, you see something that's not fair, you should do something about it. Although I was very nervous, shy, and it wasn't always so easy, but I had great examples. And then we had the support also of the community there and my parents, and that's how we'd been raised. My, my friends and the other students pretty much ignored the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And my normal life went on. We were such ordinary kids in so many ways. I mean, I went roller skating with my friend Connie. I went to slumber parties. I studied for my classes. And all of that went on, but then we would also have these depositions we would go to, and the first time I flew in an airplane was to go to the appeals court in St. Louis when I was in, I think, 10th grade. So it was just kind of a mix of things, and it all seemed very strange and bizarre, but nothing could have been more strange than the war going on. And so it was hard to be happy or excited about our case that much because of the terrible things that were going on in Vietnam. Yeah, it was hard as a shy kid to do any of it. And for a long time, even after we won the case, I didn't really want to talk about it all that much. I wanted the reporters to go talk to the older kids. But they kept zeroing in on Mary Beth Tinker and they wanted to talk to Mary Beth Tinker. I think was because I was one of the youngest. And so eventually I just decided I was gonna to have to step up and make something of this since people were interested in it. And maybe I could use it in some way to encourage young people to speak up and stand up for the things that would make a better world. It was intimidating to be with the lawyers, even from the, the ACLU lawyer, Dan Johnston, was wonderful because he was just out of law school and he was very kind and supportive, which we kind of needed then because some people were really mad at us for wearing the black armbands. But the school board attorneys, and there was a team of them, they wanted to always make it out like we had just been the pawns of our parents and they manipulated us and they would say things like, well, who pinned that armband on you? But what they didn't realize is we didn't have to have our parents pin the armband on us. We had already internalized their values so much. And so, of course, we were influenced by our parents. But looking back at it now, I, I think, well, that's what you kind of want kids to be influenced by your parents, by their parents, especially if they have values like ours did of getting along with others and respecting others and those kinds of values. But yeah, the, the attorneys would always like to make it out like we were just being, you know, we were just these stupid kids who were manipulated by our parents. I thought that we would lose every 
level of the case that we were involved with because I couldn't imagine that some big important judges were going to say that, oh yeah, kids had a right to break the rules and the principal was wrong and the school board was wrong and the teachers were wrong and, you know, I just thought we would lose for sure. So it didn't really surprise me at any point. I just saw a letter not too long ago by my dad and Bill Eckhart, Chris Eckhart's father. It was a general letter to the public and supporters saying, you know, we've decided to appeal the case to the appeals level, but we're going to have to raise a little bit of money to help the ACLU, and it's going to cost $500. So we better get to work on raising that money, um, which is kind of funny, thinking that you could take a case to the appeals court now for $500 would be unheard of. But, um, you know, mostly the adults were involved in that, and, you know, they would, we would be involved somewhat knowing what was going on, but it's mostly the decisions of the, the legal team and our parents. I think I was a little clueless growing up because I didn't understand that it was going to be so important and that it was going to be defining students' rights in the public schools 50 years later. I mean, if you would have asked me, I would have had no idea about all of that. Um, so, no, I didn't know anything about And we didn't know that the Supreme Court would take the case, first of all. They only take around 70 cases out of around 10,000, I think. So there was no guarantee that they were going to hear the case. And then I thought for sure we would lose at the Supreme Court, but I've since talked to others who know about these things, and they had a feeling that we were going to win. Mm -hmm. lawyers and school administrators and things, you know, who were following the courts and knew the people that were on the courts, people like Thurgood Marshall, William Brennan, um, Justice White, Douglas, you know, others. So there was a feeling on the court. I mean, it was the Warren Court and, and um, very strong for people's rights and for the rights of, of even kids. I never thought that, I, I never wished that we wouldn't have been involved in the case because, I mean, really, I didn't have to sacrifice that much. Yes, there were some crazy people that threatened us and threw red paint at our house and things like that. But we had the civil rights kids to compare and the civil rights adults. I mean, you know, Watts was going on. Malcolm X had been murdered. Um, the Birmingham children had been bombed and killed. Uh, there were so many things that had been going on. So we always kind of felt like, well, this is nothing. Okay, we were suspended from school for a week or two, but compared to that, this is nothing. I mean, even Claudette Colvin, who I learned about later, who you know, took her action before Rosa Parks. I mean, she had to sacrifice and we we really didn't have to that much. I mean, we always compared it to the sacrifices, I think, of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. We had, when we went to the Supreme Court, I had just moved to a new school and a new city, St. Louis. And it was November, and I knew no one at that school. So I was so shy. And then, oh, it's time to go to the Supreme Court. So that was really strange, the whole experience. And coming back then when we won, a couple of months later in February, um, it was just really strange. I remember being at our house, and the reporter was there, and um, my dad was out of town. He was actually getting ready to go to the Paris Peace Talks for, with the Quakers. And um, my older brother John had gone off to college. Bonnie was gone. Len my older brother Leonard was gone. So it was just me, Hope, and Paul, and my mom that were there. And my mom went and got some ice cream and soda pop, and we had a little celebration. But we kind of feel real happy. By this time, I was pretty cynical. I was also kind of in shock at my new school. Yeah. And um, it was a terrible year for the war. 1969, and so it, we couldn't really rejoice. And also, I mean, we hadn't stopped the war. Oh, we were supposed to celebrate because we could wear little black armbands now. It didn't feel like such a great victory. And it took me many years to see that it was a victory for students' rights. But really, when it came to having a say about 
how the economy goes and whether the priority is going to be war or people. We didn't really make a difference in that way. We didn't make a dent in the war, I don't think. Although, I mean, I have talked to others who felt like it did make a difference, even in the war. Um, I was talking to Daniel Ellsberg one time. We were on a panel together, and he said he thought that all of those things together did make a difference. And I suppose it did in the long run. But, I mean, since then, we've been involved in so many other wars. And now, just now a big report has come out about Afghanistan and how the U.S. government lied through several administrations. And so it just looks like, you know, there isn't a whole lot to be happy about when it comes to the United States and war. Well, my teenage years were kind of rocky. Right around the time that we went to the Supreme Court, I also became gay, and I had a girlfriend at my new school in St. Louis. So that was all a very big shock and very emotional, and, and I wasn't sure how to deal with that because it was 1968 and 69, and, you know, there was a thought that being gay was a mental illness and that there's something wrong with you, so I sort of had to deal with all of that also at the same time. So after we won the case, um, I went on, I finished high school. Well, I moved out of my house a little bit early. That was very upsetting to my parents. Um, so we went through some kind of difficult times there. And um, then I didn't want to go to college because I had been an apprentice for a piano technician who I met when I was in high school. And so I had been working at this piano shop, and um, my mom was a professor, and she was getting in trouble by that time for her beliefs a lot. So I thought, well, I don't want to go to college. I'll just be some person who's always getting in trouble again, so maybe I'll just fix pianos, and that'll be a little more, um, you know, safe of a profession, which I did, and I really, really loved that. But then when it came to speaking up about the Armand case, I would try to direct reporters towards the other students who were involved in it, but they just didn't want that. They wanted to talk to Mary Beth. So eventually, I slowly, I went back to school, and I became a nurse, and I worked mostly with kids and teenagers, and I started seeing the status of youth in our country and how unfair it is and how kids are the most likely age group to live in poverty, for example, with all of the effects that that has. And I was taking care of kids who had asthma. Why? Because the big polluters were not following the law. And kids who lived in crummy housing because the slumlords were making money off of their terrible, you know, suffering. And so many other things. And I was, I was a trauma nurse, so I was taking care of kids that were shot and you know, so I started thinking, wow, these kids really need to speak up for themselves. This is not right. And they are so powerful when young people speak up for themselves. Yes, they have adult allies. But when young people, like any person, speaks for themselves, it's more powerful. And so slowly, eventually, I decided to speak more about the case to kids and give them another example. We had examples of young people speaking up, and I thought, maybe I can share this and that those kids can have an example. And also, it seemed as I started speaking in the schools that kids love this case. They really take to it, I think because we won and because it was kids and I was in eighth grade, you know, and so I started realizing that we could really teach a lot of the fundamentals of democracy through this case, like the First Amendment, the right to free speech, free press, assemble, petition, the right to your own religious beliefs and, and views, and that, you know, we need that in our country. And we need young people to advocate for themselves. And when things are better for kids, it's better for everyone. There was no one specific event that made me think that I should be out in the school speaking with students more. And I, I remained active um, politically in different areas while I was a nurse around healthcare access and 
um, economic inequality and things like that. But um, one of the lawyers of the Student Press Law Center about six years ago suggested that maybe we should take a tour of the United States and go to schools and teachers' conferences and, and speak to community people about students' rights all over the country. And so we decided to do that. And his name is Mike Heastan, and we called it the Tinker Tour. And we rented a 29-foot van and decorated it for the First Amendment. And it said civics education, free speech for students, free press. And, and we started traveling around the country. And we went to over 100 schools and conferences and colleges and universities speaking about young people's rights and how when young people take a stand and speak up about things, how powerful it is. And the other purpose of our travels was to listen to young people and hear about all the things that young people are speaking up about. And there are so many. And so it was very, very heartening and exciting to meet so many kids from elementary school kids all the way up to law school students and hear about all the things that young people are doing to make a better world. Well, yeah, that's a big part of my message with, with students is that you're going to have these feelings. And that's one thing that kids and young people are very good at, having feelings. Don't suppress those and don't paper them over. Um, remember those feelings. Keep them close to your heart. And then you can do something with those feelings. You can take action. And the amazing thing is, is that when you do that, it makes you feel better. So really our story is partly about how to deal with grief and how to deal with those sad feelings that we have naturally from living in this unfair, unsafe world where the earth is so disrespected and all of its creatures and people are treated so unfairly, especially kids. But we can do something about that. And when we do and we join up with others, to work on that and change that, it makes, it makes you feel better. And so I like to ask kids, if they say, well, I went to the school board and we took five people and we complained about the styrofoam plates in our lunches and I said, well, that's great. And how did you feel when you did that? And they always say, it felt great. And so that's part of the reason why. I so the biggest takeaway was that when Kids and young people will take action. Mm -hmm. They like it. And they feel, no, they're not always going to win everything they speak up about. I was just with some middle school kids that had a petition about their uniform policy. And they may not win that, but it, they're having a lot of fun trying. And it's really making them feel good and empowered trying it. But there are just so many things that students are speaking up from their not being able to wear hats and yoga pants and the curriculum in their schools to, um, you know, web neutrality and um, gay rights, women's rights, trans rights, um, immigration rights. That's a huge, you know, issue in schools now. And the climate and the environment. I'm so glad to see so many students speaking up about that. I mean, thousands and thousands of students are on the move when it comes to the climate, of course. And it's really wonderful to see. But there's one thing that does strike me that so many students, of all the students I talk about, hardly any students talk about war. Last week at a middle school in Florida, one girl said she, that is her issue, war. And it's unusual to hear that. Students are speaking up about lots and lots of other things. But I think with war, it's like a fish in water. We just don't even notice it. It's so, um, you know, ubiquitous or something. It's, it's just part of our lives that we don't even think about and, and it's not really out there as much as it should be. Certainly middle school kids and high school kids aren't looking at the war budget and thinking about how much it costs. So I like to point out to them the, the Pentagon report that I just saw, for example, that said that 250 million per day has been sent on war for the last 16 years. and. There's a nuclear treaty coming up for renewal that students should know about, but they don't. So that's something that has been striking.
of the major issues that are talked about, I mean, I'd say racism is huge, and I emphasize that myself and try to encourage all the students to start groups at their school, anti-racism groups, and many are doing that. That's a huge issue, the environment, immigration, so many other things. But war, I think, is, I don't know. It's, it's tied into all the other issues because it's an issue of racism. It's an issue of the environment and the climate. It's the most destructive thing, I think, to the environment. Um, and then our economy, our unjust economy, and how kids get basically ripped off by all the money that goes into war. And why is it not talked about? I think it's such a basic part of our US system that if we would stop the defense, so-called defense spending, you know, that a lot of people would be unhappy. War works very well for some people. They're making a lot, a lot of money off of it. I mean, you can go in the metro in Washington, D.C. and see ads for contractors, you know, for various weapon systems that you're just thinking, what? I'm having to look at this while I'm riding on the subway. But um, yeah, why is war not talked about? But some people try to talk about it. groups like Veterans for Peace, which I'm a member of, even though I'm not a veteran, but we can still support them. Um, but all ties together. And Martin Luther King understood that. I really admired his speech at Riverside Church when he came out against the Vietnam War. And he said that the civil rights movement and the war are so tied in together. And people like Reverend Barber from North Carolina, he puts it all together. A lot of people do, but students in, in the public schools and in the independent schools don't always, and I think we need to work on that. The Supreme Court ruled in 1969 that students in public schools would have free speech and expression rights except speech that substantially disrupts school, and that was directly based on the Freedom Summer students, and number two, speech that impinges on the rights of others, whatever that means. And that was debated, it's been debated ever since. And then there were three cases after ours that cut back on the rights of students, and all four of these cases are ACLU cases. So there was Bethel versus Frazier, and then the Hazelwood case, which was the most destructive to students' rights, although 13 states have passed legislation circumventing that ruling. And then the most recent, the infamous Morris v. Frederick Bong Hits for Jesus case. And in that case, Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice, said that the Tinker ruling should be overturned. He said that in his, in his opinion in that case. Uh, and there are those who believe that the Tinker ruling should be overturned. But the fact is the Tinker ruling leaves a lot of room for censorship. Because all you have to do is basically show that there's a substantial disruption, and it is supposed to be substantial, or that a school can predict a substantial disruption, or that the speech is impinging on the rights of others. So therefore, you have, you know, some hate speech has been blocked, which is probably good, like Confederate flags are blocked because of the ruling. Um, you have shirts that say, God is ashamed of your homosexuality that have not been allowed, probably because it impinges on the rights of others, uh, I think. And a variety of other, you know, speech has, has been censored based on the Tinker ruling. But it has also empowered certain speech, like a girl in Arizona recently, Mariah, she was able to wear her Black Lives Matter shirt to school because the school attorneys contacted the principal and basically you know, clarified that under Tinker, you couldn't stop her from wearing Black Lives Matter shirt if you're allowing other kids to wear writing on their shirts. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's been good for students' rights at times, but it also does leave some leeway to cut back on students' rights. And in the Tinker ruling, it says that either, neither teachers or students leave their right to express themselves when they cross the schoolhouse gate. 
So teachers' rights and students' rights usually go together in general. And when it's a good time for students' rights, it's usually a good time for teachers' rights. But that's not now. Now is generally a bad time for students' rights, and also it's not a good time for teachers' rights either. Although teachers are, are gathering and they're organizing and they're having a lot of success with their unions, but um, when it comes to free speech for students, it's not a good time. And that goes for colleges also because you have this whole, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? This force of a conservative, this narrative, a conservative narrative saying that conservative voices are being stifled in the universities. And of course, that narrative has been slowly um, built up very methodically, very systematically over the years. And, and so you have groups like the Koch brothers that are, are behind that kind of a narrative, but others have you know, signed onto it as well. So it's not really a great time for student speech in, in colleges, universities, or in the K-12 schools as well. And also, when we talk about the Tinker case, we're just talking about student speech rights. There are all kinds of other rights that students have lost. Um, a case called Rodriguez versus Texas, I think it was, that the Supreme Court ruled that you do not have a right to equal education in the United States. And um, Robert Moses of SNCC and now the Algebra Project, he has spoken a lot about that and has a book about the constitutional right to education that he's, he's edited. But so, yeah, there are a lot of other issues having to do with students, literacy, the right to literacy. There's a big case in Michigan for students um, who are suing, saying that they should have a right to better schools. Detroit, I think, has sued. You have lead poisoning in Flint, Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all kinds of other issues having to do with students' rights. But what we're talking about with the Tinker case is students' free speech rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's been a great erosion. The issue of students' rights, racism, war and peace, economic inequality, the environmental crisis that we're dealing with right now, women's rights, it all goes together. And that's the whole intersectionality. And even when I was growing up, we had a feeling about that, but it wasn't called intersectionality. But Julian Bond, how he spoke up, going back in the SNCC people, and then we built our work on what they did, and it was all related. <laughs>